upon a forest of mixed growth somewhere on the eastern spurs of the Carpathians. A man stood one winter night watching and listening, as though he waited for some beast in the woods to come within range of his vision and, later, of his rifle. But the game for, who, for whose presence he kept so keen an outlook was none that figured in the sportsman's calendar as lawful and proper for the chase. Ulrich von Gradwitz patrolled the dark forest in quest of a human enemy. The forest lands of Gradwitz were of wide extent and well stocked with game. The narrow strip of precipitous woodland that lay on its outskirt, outskirt was not remarkable for the game it harbored or the shooting it afforded, but it was the most jealously guarded of all its owner's territorial possessions. A famous lawsuit in the days of his grandfather had wrested it from the illegal possession of a neighboring family of petty landowners. The dispossessed party had never acquiesced in the judgment of the courts, a long series of poaching affrays, and similar scandals had embittered the relationships between the families for three generations. The neighbor feud had grown into a personal one since Ulrich had come to be head of his family. If there was a man in the world who he detested and wished ill to, it was George Zimmerman. The in interior of the quarrel and the tireless game snatcher and raider of the disputed border forest. The feud might, perhaps, have died down or been compromised if the personal ill will of the two men had not stood in the way. As boys, they had thirsted for one another's blood. As men, each prayed the misfortune might fall on the other. And this wind-scourged winter night, Ulrich had banded together his foresters to watch the dark forest, not in quest for four-footed quarry, but to keep a lookout for the prowling thieves whom he suspected of being afoot from across the land boundary. Yes. <laughs> he strayed away by himself from the watchers, whom he had placed in ambush on the crest of the hill, and wandered far down the steep slopes amid the wild tangle of undergrowth peering through the tree trunks and listening for the whistle and skirtling of the wind and the restless beating of the branches for sights and sounds of the marauders. If only on this wild night, in the, this dark, lone spot, he might come across George Zimmerman, a man to man with no none to witness. That was the wish that he uppermost in his thoughts. And as he stepped around the tree trunk of a huge beech, he came face to face with the man he sought. And as he stepped round the trunk of a huge beech tree, he came face to face with the man he sought. The two enemies stood, glaring at one another for a long silent moment. Each had a rifle in his hand, each had hate in his heart, and murder utmost on his mind. And before the moment of hesitation had given way to action, a deed of nature's own violence overwhelmed them both. A fierce shriek of the storm had been answered by a splitting crash over their heads, and ere they could leap aside a mass of falling beech tree and thunder down on them. Lightning! 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 This production has been sponsored by Nerf. At his side, so near that under ordinary circumstances, he could almost have touched him, lay George Zahn, alive and struggling. Ah! <laughs> but obviously as helplessly pinned down by him as himself. All around them lay thick, strewn wreckage and of splintered branches and broken twigs. So you're not dead, but you're caught. Caught in your stolen forest. This is justice. Ha. But I'm caught in my own forest. When my men come to release us, you wish you weren't here. Are you sure your men will come first? I have men in this forest too. And when they come, you will be sorry. Here's a useful hint. My men have orders to come in ten minutes. Seven of which have already gone by. When they come, you will be sorry. Good. Death and damnation to you, Ulrich von Gradwitz. Same to you, George Zeidman. Forest thief. Game snatcher. Both men spoke with the bitterness of possible defeat before them, for each knew that it might be long before his men would seek him out or find him. It was a bare matter of chance which party would arrive first on the scene. 
Both had now given up the useless struggle to free themselves from the mass of wood that held them down. Ulrich limited his endeavors to an effort to bring his one partially free arm near enough to his outer coat pocket to draw out his wine flask. Even when he had accomplished that operation, it was long before he could manage the unscrewing of the stopper or get any of the liquid down his throat. But what a heaven-sent drought it seemed. It was an open winter, and little snow had fallen as yet. Hence, the captives suffered less from the cold than might have been the case of, at that season of the year. Nevertheless, the wine was warming and reviving to the wounded man, and he looked across with something like a throb of pity to where his enemy lay, just keeping the groans of pain and weariness from crossing his lips. If I threw this flask over to you, would you be able to get it? Asked Ulrich suddenly. There's some good wine in it, and one might as well be comfortable, for tonight one of us dies. No, I can I scarcely see anything. There's blood caked around my eye, and I don't drink with an enemy. Ulrich was silent for a few minutes, and lay listening to the weary screeching of the wind. An idea was slowly forming and growing in his brain. An idea that gained strength every time that he looked across at the man who was fighting so grimly against pain and exhaustion. In the pain and languor that or Ulrich himself was feeling, the old fierce hatred seemed to be dying down. Neighbor, do as you please if your men come first. As for me, I've changed my mind. If my men come first, you will be helped as if you were my guest. We've always been fighting over this worthless forest. <laughs> If you help me put this quarrel behind us, I will ask you to be my friend. We're good. I've never thought of anything but hating you for all my life. Being trapped for this last half hour has changed my mind, and you offered me your wine flask. All work on graduates, I will be your friend. For a space, both men were silent, turning over in their minds the wonderful changes that this dramatic reconciliation would bring about. In the cold, gloomy forest, with the wind tearing in fitful gusts through the naked branches and whistling around the tree trunks, they lay and waited for the help that would now bring release and succor to both parties. And each prayed a private prayer that his men might be the first to arrive so that he might be the first to show honorable attention to the enemy that had become a friend. Let's shout for help. Our voices might carry a little. It won't carry through the trees and undergrowth, but we can try. The two raised their voices in a prolonged hunting call. Hunting call! Hunting call! Ulrich, a few minutes later, said, Together again. HUNTING CALL! I heard nothing but the wind. There was silence again for some minutes, and then Ulrich gave a joyful cry. I can see figures coming through the wood. They're coming down the same way that I came down the hillside. Both men raised their voices in as loud a shout as they could muster. Help! They hear us! Who are they? I can't tell. They're not mine. Oh! Oh! 